بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته واهتدى بهديه ودعا بدعوته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا يقربنا إليك يا رب العالمين اللهم افتح لنا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين صدق الله العظيم Dear students, I begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The greatest, the mightiest, the compassionate I seek the salutations and abundant blessings of Allah to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and all the other prophets. May Allah bless us, bless this gathering in this blessed place and may he accept our presence for his sake and may he enable us to implement what we learn in these sessions. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Inshallah we start our Dars <coughs> and the chapters that we are going to cover today if I inshallah succeed in doing so within the time that I have are quite important and they are very relevant to our class in fact the first chapter that we will go over today which is the second chapter of the book itself this is the foundation and if the foundation is laid wrong then the construction will also be crooked therefore I remind myself first and foremost as I sit here and all of us present here to pay attention to what the author is saying to us in this chapter Hence, accordingly, purify, rectify, improve intentions. Because as you can see that the chapter has been titled as Faslun fi niyati fi hali ta'allum The purpose of study. There is a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the very foundational prophetic saying. And this hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brings to us the essence of deen and the purpose of deen. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stated, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئِمْ مَا نَوَى فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إلى آخر الحديث Amr al-Khattab رضي الله تعالى عنه relates that actions are by intention whatever we do human beings as a result of their intellect at least shouldn't do anything vain 
at least. We are here, we are here for a purpose. When you go out, you should go out for a purpose. When you visit some, someone, you should visit someone for a purpose. Anything, in, any human activity that takes place in your life should have an aim, objective. Similarly, our deen places a lot of emphasis on having an intention and that is not sufficient. Having the right intention is very important. Shaykh Abdul Hassan Ali Nadiwi rahimahullah ta'ala writes, one of, the very, uh, one of the very great scholars of our recent past. He says, In addition to recognizing the importance of intention in Islam, it is ironic to see that Muslims may not oftentimes have the evil intention but have no intention for the things that are very important for them to have the intention. And then he says, as a result, they lose out two things. Number one, they would deprive themselves of the blessings of Allah. Number two, they will not be guided to the right, you know, the right conclusion. And one of the great scholars, Shaykh Taqi Rasmani Hafizullah Ta'ala, he said that our 24 hours of life can become the source of goodness and virtues and blessings and reward provided we do two things. All, it is inclusive of each and every human activity, not just prayer, not just Quran, Quranic recitation or Zikrullah, etc anything and everything, we can make that a ibadat, a worship literally, provided we do two things. Number one, he says, have the right intention. And number two, we bring that on the pattern of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life. Because his life is not just about prayer, fasting, dhikr. He lived his life in different faces and in different ways and venues. For instance, he was a husband, he was a religious figure, he was a spokesperson, he was a, he was a statesman, and he was an army general, etc., etc. So we have ample guidance in his life. So when we have the intention and then we match our action with his pattern, then that action of our own becomes ibadat. So it is our choice at the end of the day whether or not we want to make that of our activity a blessed one. And when it comes to seeking the knowledge of deen, it is crucial and pertinent and absolutely important. Why? Because there are enough serious warnings from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as he said, مَنْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ عِلْمًا لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ أَوْ أَرَادَ بِهِ وَجْهًا Prophet said, reported by Imam Tirmizi, whoever seeks a knowledge for anything other than Allah, for, any, for anyone other than the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, and he seeks the pleasure of pleasing people to satisfy the criteria and the standards of human being or name or fame etc etc so what is the warning it is a very serious one it is tantamount and identical to the other warning the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam mentioned that whoever will fabricate a hadith and would attribute to me whatever the outcome that person will have in his or her life would be the same for this person imagine fabricating a narration and attributing it to prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he hasn't said it he said he should prepare his abode in jahannam and for the person who is similarly seeking the same knowledge, but for, uh, for something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he will have the same, uh, same result and consequence. Both of them should prepare their abode in Jahannam. Why is it so serious? If you think logically, why did he say something so serious? I mean, we can understand if someone fabricating a narration and attributing it to Rasul sallallahu is a great sin and a daring. But why is it someone seeking knowledge 
and reading the text correct and everything, simply that he doesn't have the intention. Let me explain this and so that we understand why is it so serious. Allahu Akbar Kabir. When we don't have the right intention, then the very right thing that we are learning, the very right blessed sign that we are learning, but we will abuse it then afterwards. And then it will become greater and worse than the first one. Or the same at least. And as a result, we would how many times do you see fatawa these days online? Manipulated fatawa. Things are taken out of context and you, being used forcefully to convince people. I had the other day one of the very learned lady, she was trying to convince me bringing distorted ayat from the Quran and telling me that Islam does not prohibit a woman to marry a non-Muslim man. All of this is because when we have the wrong intention or no intention as a result of that this is what going to happen. No, that he had, I mean, she had that obviously the motiva motivation to marry someone, but I'm speaking of, uh, uh, there are different cases that I have dealt with, and the one that I'm saying to you is one of the many, and this is an active woman who tries to convince people that this is how it is. And there are two different things. One, there is a young girl who wants to marry someone non-Muslim, and there is another one who is active, and actively promoting this idea, ideology, and both of the things are seen different, right? So I'm speaking of the other type. So therefore, we cannot say that this is why because of that reason. Wallahu alam. The point to be noted is not really that incident in per se, rather when a person has the wrong intention, as a result it will lead to the wrong conclusion. That's the what, this is the point that I'm trying to draw to our attention. And this, this one example came to my mind to share. There are many other things. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Similar to that, there, are, I mean, there is a very known person on the internet, I won't mention his name, and he tries to even... Pro, and there are many of his lectures online. He says that the, the, the modern, time, modern time riba is not really riba, it is permissible and halal. So there are many examples of that. So it's not just one or two examples, it is the, I, the mentality behind it. And this is why Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa strict such a ish, serious warning. He issued such a serious warning, it's very much similar to the warning that he used for a person who would fabricate a narration. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. There is another hadith of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reported by Imam Tirmizi rahimahullah ta'ala. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man talab al-ilm li yumariya bihi al-sufaha, aw yujariya bihi al-ulama, aw yasrifa bihi wujuha al-nas, ilayhi adkhalahu Allahu al-nar. Al-Iyazu Billah. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Whoever would seek a knowledge, and his aim and intention, or her aim and intention, is one of the three. Li yumariya bihi al-sufaha. And this is really uh, being seen these days quite often than before. Just for the sake of argument, people want to study. So that I could have information to argue pe with people. And Prophet said, whoever would seek knowledge, so that he could engage in argument with people, this is number one. Number two, or even to debate with the scholars. And the third, he said, or to attract the attention of people towards him. I know some individuals, like it, it, was, it was brought to my attention a number of times, there are some individuals, they go online, they do research, and they gather information, and whenever they get the opportunity to go to any gathering, out of 
and absolutely out of no clue, and there is no reason for them to, to bring up the discussions of that nature, they will start to discuss things and try to gain the attention of people. And in the pursuit of that, the man said, Hajj is not for in Islam. I mean, I can speak on and on, giving you the examples of the type of, you know, insanity that I have seen. So, then what happens? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَدْخَلَهُ اللَّهُ النَّارِ His abode is Jahannam. Astaghfirullah alayhi May Allah save all of us from this. <coughs> So therefore, the author has started the book as the second chapter of this book, that the purpose of study. And the hadith that I quoted to you really serves as a foundation to our deen. And that hadith, or in light of that hadith, in this that has seen as one of the maqasid of sharia. Among the maqasid of sharia is that, you know, al-umuru bi maqasidiha. Actions would be looked at, at the end of the day, the intention behind them. And the author also says, how many actions do you see outwardly, they appear to be absolutely purely of the worldly nature, but simply because of the sincere intention behind them, they, they, are, they have very high ranking in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the other hand, there are, he says, there are how many actions, actions that you have come across in your life, they apparently appear to your eyes absolutely purely from the religious nature. But in the sight of Allah, they mean nothing, absolutely nothing. Perhaps even the source of displeasure and the punishment of Allah. There, there is a very famous hadith, you know, reported by scholars of hadith, Imam Muslim, rahimahullah, and others, that three people will be brought on the Day of Judgment. A warrior, a scholar, and at the same time, a man, a rich, wealthy man. And Allah will ask them, what did you do with these of my bounties? They will say, Ya Allah, I, prom I promoted your deen. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. I taught people your religion. And the other one will say, I gave up my life for the sake of the propagation of your deen. And the third say, I, I spent my wealth right and left to help out needy for the sake of your pleasure. Allah said, no. You did that so that people could call you a learned man, so that people could call you a generous man, so that people could call you a very brave person. And you had it what you wanted for. And in other narration, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, then Allah will tell them, go to those people and ask them for the reward, not me. And فَصُحِبَ عَلَىٰ وَجْهِ وَأُلْقِيَ فِي النَّارِ Then they will be dragged on their faces and thrown in Jahannam. So the actions apparently appear to our eyes absolutely purely of religious nature, but because of the absence of this, it will lose out absolutely the, the reward and the pleasure of Allah. And there are many actions, they appear to our eyes of the worldly nature, but because of the sincere intention behind, subhanAllah, even that will be seen as the reward. For instance, Rasulullah Wasallam said, if a husband places a morsel of food in the mouth of his wife, even if he does that with the sincere intention, he will be rewarded for that. So much so, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, even a person engages in the, in the conjugal relationship with his spouse, what did he say? He will be rewarded for that. Sahaba Rizwan Allah alayhi wa they asked, Ya Rasulullah, how is it a person is satisfying his carnal desire and why will he be rewarded for that? Why will she be rewarded for it? What did he say? Had he not earned sin if he had satisfied the desire in a wrong way? Had he done, if he were to commit sin, adultery, as he were going to be punished because of that, when they do the things in a right way, they will be rewarded equally. So it is all about the right intention. So each and everything, as Shaykh Taqir Usman Hafizullah said, right intention according to the action of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sunnah of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then our amal and action will become blessed and ibadat. And when we think of, or when we talk of the intention, the purpose, the objective, now there could be a number of things, but the author has mentioned several that 
a seeker of knowledge should be mindful of throughout the course of study. It is, I mean, if you sum that all up, you can say the pleasure of Allah. But he has subdivided and he mentioned a number of things, part of the intentions, part of the same intention that we should, to elaborate more on the type of intentions that the people, the students of knowledge should have. So number one, what he said, you know, the رضا الله سبحانه وتعالى First and foremost, we should have the intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to know His will behind that knowledge. What He wants us to learn from it and to be. And number two, seeking the salvation in the after. That through this knowledge I want to have salvation, the success in the hereafter. Not in this world, in the hereafter. And number three, izalatul jahli an nafsihi wa an al juhali. To remove the ignorance first and foremost from his own life and the lives of those who do not know. So this is also part of intention that they should, that the seekers of knowledge should have. That as I learn to remove the ignorance. And also when I am able to see people of the ignorance, try to share in, an, in a way that would, that would appeal them, would make them understand and follow it. So that they also remove the ignorance from their lives. Number four, Ihya Uddin. Reviving Islam, reviving, reviving religion in life, in his life. Because without knowledge, no matter how sincere you are, you cannot revive religion in your life. Because as I have explained repeatedly in the past, that you know, they go hand in hand. Islam means submission, but through knowledge. And number five, ibqa'ul Islam fi hayatihi. To make, you know, to, to make him remain steadfast on the path of deen till he dies. And this is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said the hadith that I said yesterday, فَقِيهٌ وَاحِدٌ أَشَدُّ عَلَى الشَّيْطَانِ مِنْ أَلْفِ عَابِدٍ A person who has sound understanding of deen, shaitan will have very much difficulty to, to, to defeat him. For instance, if, if someone t tells you and tries to convince you that you don't pray, you will not be able to convince. You, 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 won't, you won't be able to follow him because you know because of your sound knowledge and sincerity that this is not right. So these are the types of intentions he says that the seeker of knowledge should have when they start this journey. The next thing what he also mentions here is one must intend with knowledge to being thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is in order to recognize the gift of intellect like I mentioned yesterday a person who is Safi mentally disabled no matter how much he or she willing to study and learn but their condition will not really help them to be able to traverse the journey a lot. So it is all about this intellect. When we have the sound intellect, I mean there are a number of things that are haram in Islam. This is one of the maqasid of sharia. One of the maqasid of sharia is hifzul aql. There are five maqasid of sharia. And one of them being the preservation of intellect. This is why in Islam we have prohibition of alcohol and all the drugs. It, because it impairs our, you know, intellect. And I have seen when I was once traveling in Europe, and I could not believe, this was my first uh, encounter that, uh, with, uh, with a man of, uh, uh, with a man who, when I met first, was very sophisticated in thinking, and we had a very healthy and very informative discussion for a long time as I was uh, traveling. And the very next day I met him, he was drunk. I could not believe this is the same person that I met yesterday. 
the way he was talking, the way he was acting, I was very surprised. And then I realized and appreciated this concept and this principle in Islam. I said, Subhanallah. You know, when you encounter a situation, then you make, it is, this makes you appreciate what you have in your religion. So the preservation of aql is one of the objectives of Islam. And therefore, you know, there are things that are haram in Islam as a result because Allah wants to, us to, to realize that, you know, you, your aql is everything in you. You know, we, you know, we sit like this, we dress up in certain ways and we talk and walk in certain ways. It is all about because of our aql. If our intellect is lost, then we will be acting like majnoon. Urinating, talking, doing things on the street maybe even. It is all because of this. It is holding us back. So it is one of, it, this is in fact, as, as in terms of the human blessings, the greatest one to human being. So he says that a person with knowledge and through it should recognize this favor of Allah and be thankful to him that he gave him the sound intellect or her the sound intellect to be able to study and digest and understand and implement. And keep in mind the hadith that I sh shared with you yesterday that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he created Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, he asked the angels, what is the best thing in him that I created? And then Allah himself said, it is his, his intellect. And through that, Allah said, I will be recognized. Through it, I will be worshipped. Through that, I will be obeyed. There is nothing other than that that makes a person obedient or rebellious. Allahu Akbar Kabirah. And then he warns that it, ne it, ne it should never be the case that we, as, is, as steady, that we do so in order to reap the vanities of this world or to obtain the pleasures from the king and the like. Prophet said in one hadith, the best ulama are those that the king are at their door, the rulers. And the worst are those who are at the doors of the kings. One of the great Syrian scholars, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was studying, he was teaching the circle of uh, the group of students in Jamar Dimash Imavi. It was long ago. And he had a pain, a situation in his leg, so therefore he had to extend his leg as he was teaching the hadith to the students. And the, the ruler of that time, because even these rulers and the kings at that time used to be somehow, mashallah, you know, respectful to the scholars. So he paid a visit to him and he came and he was standing at the door. The sheikh continued to teach and, you know, didn't pay much attention, attention to him. A few moments passed, half an hour or so. He continued to stay there, stand up there at the corner. And he didn't, it was not that he was intentionally ignoring him, he was, he was so, much, so much immersed in his education, in, in his lesson. So then he, the, the king left and then he sent a gift, you know, a bag full of you know, money, coins with his khadim, servant, to offer it as a, gesture, as a token of appreciation and, and, uh, and humility to the uh, scholar. So the servant came and offered that. And first he said salam on behalf of the ruler and king and said, you know, Sheikh, uh, he has sent this present for you and he requests you to accept it. So the moral of this, uh, uh, less, uh, this story and this incident lies here. He said, say my salam back to your king and tell him that did he not notice when he was here that I had extended my leg. And those who extend their legs before someone, they don't extend their hands. So this is the type of sincerity in ikhlas. And the king was at his door, not he was at, his, at their door. So this is what he was trying to say, because at back then, Muslim, uh, uh, many of the Muslim scholars were at the same time, you know, were, were appointed by the rulers and the kings of, the, of that time as the, as the Qazi, as the official Mufti and etc, etc. So it is addressing to them in general and also in our time. Anyhow, <coughs> so he warns us against the 
negative intention or the bad intention that a person who is seeking knowledge to seek the pleasure of, of people or vanities of this world, all of these are the wrong intention that the student of knowledge should avoid and abstain from. In addition to that, he also says that one should seek knowledge with great personal acidity and not apply to it to this base and small and perishable world. In other words, have zuhud fi dunya. That we are to study simply for the sake of Allah and to educate people, first and foremost to educate ourselves and not to earn anything by it or using the knowledge for the source of, as a source of earning the world. Rather have the zuhud fi dunya. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one of the narrations said, actually a person came to him and asked, Ya Rasulullah, inni uhibbu an akuna mahbuban inda Allah wa inda nas. Ya Rasulullah, I would like to be beloved in the sight of Allah and in the sight of people both. How can I gain this rank? It was quite a tricky question. Because, I mean, to Allah we know, but to please people, and everyone has different personality. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a very simple and a very clear wordings, he said two things very short and simple and sweet, yet to the point. He said, Is had fi dunya yuhibbuk Allah. Have zuhud, you know, subhanAllah, have uh, disinterest yourself in, in the belongings of the world, Allah will love you. Because Allah has no, I mean, has what whatsoever, no, uh, any place in, you know, near him for this world. Because Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, had this world been equal to the wing of a mosquito important to Allah, the situation would have been different in this world. It is that weightless, worthless to Allah. So if you want to be the person of Allah, then you should see the world as that. Absolutely worthless. And the second thing he said, was hathima inda nas yuhibbuka nas If you want people to love you, then disinterest yourself in whatever they have. You, know, you would be very nice to me and would be at the best with me as soon as, I mean so long as I don't ask you for anything. The sooner I start asking you, give me money, give me that, you will, you will start running away from me. This is human nature. So he said, was hathima inda nas yuhibbuka nas If you show zuhud in what people, with respect to what people have, subhanAllah, then you will not uh, then they will love you. And at the narration, Prophet ﷺ gave three beautiful pieces of advice. This subhanAllah, he said, Salli salata muwadda'in. Each time you pray, make your prayer as if it, it is going to be the last one. Because you never know whether you will be given the chance again to pray. Salli salata ka salata muwadda'in. The one who is bidding farewell. And the second he said, لا تكلم بكلام تعذر منه غدا صلى الله عليه وسلم. I mean it is, mashallah, we are in this society. It is very uh, uh, good mannerism in this society that you know 